Well, I'm here with meteorologist, chief meteorologist, Chris Scott, and it's time to debrief this one heck of a heat dome and unprecedented wildfire situation so early in the season in British Columbia. Satellite imagery at the surface, this looks like a beautiful day across the province of BC. Yeah, I think the giveaway here, Ty, as you know, is that the clouds are way offshore. So that marine layer was out to sea. We just baked, and it really is the jet stream. If you're looking for a cause of this event, it's the jet stream and all of the actors coming together just perfectly, creating this big dome, as, as you coined it, and it's really a big bulge in the jet stream to the north. A lot of sinking air, it sat in place, and that high pressure system, unfortunately, just baked uh, most of BC, parts of Alberta, and the NWT as well. And, and it's rare just to get all of these weather actors to sort of coalesce to this one single solution. 2009, July 2009 rings a bell. Some of these actors came together, but it's really the length of this show. We had a significant blocking pattern in the atmosphere that allowed the temperatures at the surface to warm a couple degrees warmer every single day. I think it was this prolonged effect. And we also talked of off air a little bit of some of the topography and the nature of this beast across Southern BC. Yeah, I think it's a case where statistically you look at this and you go, oh my gosh, it just it defies what the distribution of history has been. But BC is a unique place. Um, having lived there, Ty, you know that you know, you're very close to a major heat source in the interior and a very arid climate. So the coast doesn't usually get hot, but it can get hot. And when you take the air off the mountains, it can warm even more. So while these stats truly do blow our minds, I don't think we can replicate the type of record shattering heat in other parts of the country that we could in BC to the same degree, because we didn't just beat these historic record highs, we smashed them by three and four degrees Celsius. And, and, and this part of the world is just predisposed to get a, a stalling sort of omega block. You just don't see the same type of uh, cutoff upper highs develop across parts of Eastern Canada, right? Yeah, like if I'm in Toronto, I wouldn't look at this and say, well, if BC does it, then we could easily beat our record and be 44. I, I just don't see that happen any, anytime soon. This was a rare event. But the, meteorolo the meteorology allows for it to some extent in BC. But then we also have to talk about climate change, Todd, and the fact that climate change plays a role here too. While the jet stream is the obvious culprit to it, we know that extreme heat events are getting more common and more extreme thanks to climate change. On the flip side, extreme cold events are not as intense and not as likely. And this is the trend over time, uh, really across the world. So when it breaks down to our greenhouse gas emissions, can you put an actual number? Like if humans have not been pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, in other words, what would these national records uh, end up being? Yeah, we can roughly say that about two degrees of this heat wave on the max temperatures was the result of climate change. And, you know, honestly, it's hard to separate everything. So it's kind of like a soup and you throw in all the vegetables in and the cauliflower dissolves and you go, Oh, well, how much did the cauliflower add to the taste of the soup? <laughs> like, oh, it's hard to say. But you can separate them to a simplistic extent and say about two degrees. So it's a very rare event meteorologically. But then you add in climate change, you add this bit on top. But that bit on top, it's kind of like layers. And eventually, that part on top can kind of break our ability to deal with it from an infrastructure as well as health perspective. Uh, I don't think we're gonna see one of these events anytime soon again, but know that overall heat waves are becoming more common and more, and more intense as well. And as you know, we send out weather balloons twice a day all around the world and the stats that came off the Northwestern tip of Washington state, here's a sounding from 800 meters elevation. What do you think of this one? 35.6 degrees Celsius. Yeah, a lot of, you know, line graph, there are all kinds of stuff, but you just have to look at, oh, that point doesn't make sense. <laughs> that's kind of out of the way. And, and that's what's happening. It's way off the axis. It's way off the scale there. It's actually up towards the, the top of the M. It's so high up. So, uh, yeah, this really was an exceptional event in so many ways. Um, it's hard to really quantify it uh, statistically, Ty, because you look back in time and we don't have a similar event, you have to look at this as an extremely rare one 
um, that we may not see for some time, but certainly it's the harbinger of distant problems that we're going to uh, face more, more of as we move forward. And in the past, locals that want to escape heat events in the lower elevations, what do they do? They head to Jasper, they head to the mountains. You head at one yeah. kilometer above the surface, Chris, and you expect to get at least somewhat of a reprieve from these prolific temperatures. Jasper, Alberta, this is the Warden Station data, broke its all-time record four times, peaking at 41 degrees Celsius, unfathomable. Well, keep in mind, these high temperatures are hotter than a lot of Ontario has ever been. <laughs> when you put it that way, it's like, wow, that's, that's really something. And um, yeah, breaking records by three and four degrees, all time record highs. And we saw that to the north too. We saw that uh, north of 60 where uh, Fort Smith and, and the Northwest Territories nearly hit 40 degrees. So, well, you know, we have seen this. This is another you know, aspect of climate change where we're seeing hotter temperatures farther north. And that's where there's more potential to really obliterate records. The farther south you go, there is increasing heat. It's just that you can't shatter your records quite as much because it was already hot to begin with. Yeah. And, and is there any science or truth to the jet stream becoming a little bit more wonky? I know the media really likes to focus yeah. in and hone in on an uncontrollable jet stream. I know the temperature gradients are starting to change as we warm those northern latitudes a little bit more than say the equator, but what's the science on the jet stream being a primary driver of an event just like this? Yeah, we always want a why, especially with bad weather. Why did that happen? Well, you know, the way I look at it, the two biggest forces we have driving our weather are the sun. The sun heats the equator regions more than the poles and the spin of the earth. So that's why when you look at this picture, you see all these swirlies. You've got low pressure, you've got high pressure. And that's, that's because of the sun heating the earth. And even without the sun, we'd still have weather if the earth was just spinning and we have water vapor. So then you have to think, okay, so how are greenhouse gas emissions potentially changing this? And the answer is we really don't know. There are some theories that suggest that this big ridge in the jet stream maybe could have been exacerbated or made more likely by changes in, in how the atmosphere is structured because of more heat in different places. But frankly, we just don't know enough to say for sure. And we may never, because it's really hard to untangle all that stuff. So I, you know, I like to try in my mind to separate it, to say, could this have happened anyway? Well, yes, the heat wave itself could have happened and it could have broken all time record highs, but it would not, we can clearly say it would not have been this bad without the climate change aspect. And that's the concern moving forward is that the potential to get hotter and hotter just keeps going as we go out the next few decades. And unfortunately that, that two degrees has the potential uh, to play a significant role in the number of excess deaths we saw, uh, saw across Washington, Oregon, and particularly across the lower mainland, the 911 and emergency calls were just uh, far and beyond above the 2011 Stanley Cup riots. So they were very significant. And it's a factor of timing too. Look at where we are at the end of June. If you wanna really bake that ground and those valleys, you wanna maximize the amount of time the sun is in the sky. And you can't get much more than what, 16 hours of daylight associated with this. And another thing, there was simply no wildfire smoke. Sometimes that smoke, can really block the solar energy from reaching the surface. So it's this literal perfect chain of events that led, led up to Lytton literally catching fire and nearly reaching 50 degrees Celsius. And, and you know, over my career too, I've seen you know, some of these extreme events. And, and I think the thing to keep in mind is uh, relative to climate change, you know, extreme events can happen in the atmosphere, they do. Uh, it does take everything lining up just right. And I think back to Hurricane Juan when it hit Halifax. You know, Juan, could you have had a stronger storm? Yes, but you could not have put a worse track in terms of impacting Halifax. Um, I, I think of this in the same way, or like the ice storm of 1998 or the Calgary floods. It's just when things come together in all the right or wrong ways, then these situations happen. And this is against the backdrop of a climate which is warming. So that's why we know with heat, well, you're not gonna get this every few years, but the likelihood of these extreme events does increase. And if you project out 100 or 150 years, then you start to talk about this becoming much, much more common.